Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, or whenever you're listening, hello to however many of you are left in Canada today. Yeah, I'm not going to make any bones about it. It kind of sucks to see Prime Minister-designate Justin Trudeau. It does. I don't make any bones about that, but the fact is, I am here to uplift you. I am here to inspire you. I am here to encourage you. Oh, well, what's the point? I'll tell you what the point is. Canada has not ended yet. Canada has not been destroyed just yet. There is still hope and there is still reason for conservatives to be excited. And I want you to pay attention to this program because I thought I got a little bit ranty last time on the show. I thought that, you know what, by breaking with the usual format of the program and by just talking about things that had been coming up and things that people had been asking me to touch on and and not really paying attention to the clock, just going, I thought I might be doing you a disservice. And you know what, the emails that I've gotten about last week's show which was basically about why the election is important and why voter turnout is something we should keep low, not high, which obviously the message didn't get out as much as I wanted it to. That episode of the show was very popular. The feedback I got was phenomenal. And in the course of preparing for the show for this week, I obviously have done a great deal of preparation, as I always try to do, but I think it's more important to speak in terms that even Justin Trudeau voters would understand. Speak in terms of the emotion and the passion, not solely the facts. I think both are important, though. The reason I don't feel as terrible as I perhaps should or as other conservative-minded individuals do is because I recognize that we did not have the most conservative government with a small c that we could have had. And it was disappointing. Now, I want to make something very clear here. I have a great deal of respect, both personal and professional, for Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who at recording time is indeed still Canada's Prime Minister. He's got a little bit of time left there. I have interviewed him on three occasions since February, and I have met him on probably close to a dozen dozen occasions, both as leader of the official opposition and as Prime Minister, and I've never had any unpleasant encounter with him. He is a man who is personable, who is intelligent, who is principled, and who I think has governed Canada through very uncertain times, both economically and both, or sorry, and also on national security, and he's governed Canada well on both of those portfolios. Now, I remember one of the ads that came out earlier in the campaign. Stephen Harper is not perfect, but he's the best choice there is. I I think that was true in this election campaign. I do, and I don't think any politician should be striving for perfection, except maybe on the hair portfolio. We know Trudeau's got everyone beat there. But I think a prime minister should be the best that they can be and try to bring the country to the best place it can be given international circumstances or global circumstances or other external factors that may make it more difficult to control what's happening. And that was a talking point that Stephen Harper had in the election. In a time of global economic uncertainty, Canada needs to stay the course. And that was a message that worked for Canadians in 2011 especially, and even in 2008. But in 2015, it wasn't enough. Now, it's important to acknowledge a couple of different factors here when you're doing the postmortem of an election. Number one is acknowledging why you lost, and I'll get to that in a moment. The other is acknowledging what happens next, which I think is the far more important question. But in order to truly answer that with a level of honesty, you need to have addressed the first question, which is what happened. So let's start there. 
I know every armchair pundit has come up with a bunch of examples in the last couple of days about what happened. And one of the best explanations I had actually seen was from Brian Lilly, a column he wrote on the rebel.media that I'll read a, a bit from shortly. And Anthony Fury, who will join me on the line in a couple of moments, had a piece in the Toronto Sun the day after the election that I think illustrates the problems as well. You have two issues. Number one, Justin Trudeau being a great mommy candidate, someone who appeals to people's emotions, appeals to people's feelings. And as Anthony Fury wrote, campaigned on feelings based on facts or uh, over facts, rather. But the other side of it is that you had a media that was unwilling to treat all of the candidates equally. A media that was unwilling to stick to the facts and a media that was unwilling to say to the candidates, we'll challenge you, but ultimately the voters decide. The media tried to be the judge, jury, and executioner politically, and as we can see now, they succeeded. I watched in the early days of the campaign, before Stephen Harper was doing one-on-one interviews, but he was taking his five questions, which the media hated. They only got five questions on his campaign stops. And I was seeing the same question four times a day, at least, sometimes five, every day, which was forcing him to respond to the daily update of the Mike Duffy trial. Every time it was the same. And every media outlet, every reporter just wanted to get their voice or their microphone or their camera in the shot. Even though the answer itself wasn't changing. Now, you can say that the answer not changing was a failing of Stephen Harper or his campaign. Or you can say that it was a failing of the media for not moving on when there was no more story there. But he was not really able to talk about the things that he wanted to talk about. Now, contrast that with what happened in the final week of the campaign when Dan Gagne, liberal advisor and campaign co-chair, steps down because it was learned that he was instructing a company, an energy company, no less, on how to lobby the government, knowing full well that there was a very realistic chance that Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party could be forming that government. An easier way of describing what happened is Dan Gagné went to the company, went to TransCanada and says, hey, look, this is the best way to ask a government for money. Well, you know, in a couple of months when they need to ask the liberal government for money, they've already been given the manual by a senior advisor to that party. So understandably, that's a bit of an issue. Justin Trudeau took one day of questions on it, called it inappropriate, said that it should have never happened, expressed his shame and the misfortune that he felt about that. And then that was over. The media moved on. Finn Donnelly, NDP candidate, former MP candidate during the election in British Columbia earlier on in the campaign, lied about Chris Alexander lied about the Syrian refugee issue. And what happens to him? Absolutely nothing. The media does not challenge him. The media does not challenge Thomas Mulcair on it. The media moves on. To whichever candidate made some stupid joke on Twitter four years ago. To a candidate that peed in a mug, whatever the case may be. And by the way, I'm not defending the mug peer. I'm just saying that it seems like there were far bigger issues and more pertinent issues on the campaign trail that could have taken a lot more time, focus, energy, and column inches than many of the things the media chose to focus on. Now, I believe in free speech. I believe that the media can report the truth As it sees it, which may not even be the truth. I believe wholeheartedly that the media gets to decide which issues they find relevant and which issues they think their audience will find relevant. But I also, under that same vein, as a member of the media myself, can say that I think they failed. I think in this election they failed at their job and they did, in fact, manipulate the process. So, too, did Lead Now. The foreign-funded action group 
which tested the limits of registered third parties of the Canadian, Canadian election and dramatically and successfully manipulated through their foreign funding and through their misinformation campaign the results of the Canadian election. Even if Justin Trudeau was on track to receive a liberal minority, it is undeniable that Lead Now, operating under the auspices of VoteTogether.ca, was responsible for that being a majority election rather than a minority election. Running countless amounts of money, literature drops, web campaigns, Bringing in, as you heard a couple of weeks ago, David Suzuki to London, Ontario, to campaign against a conservative incumbent. And it worked. Mission accomplished. They can claim success off of the backs of voters who wanted to support the NDP, voters who wanted to support the Green Party, voters who wanted to support other parties as well. And the problem is that this will lead to Canada becoming a country with two parties and two parties alone. Because that's what strategic voting urges. It urges you to look at politics as a binary, as though you have only one choice in the status quo and one other choice in one viable alternative. And that's it. And I get that vote splitting is a hugely problematic territory in a lot of ridings. I mean, that was one of the things that led to, in the 2011 election, so many conservatives being elected in the 416 and 905 areas. You had three-way splits, ridings where the Liberal, the NDP, and the Conservative candidates were all within a reasonably close area to one another. And the problem was that then you have the Conservative running up through the middle while the Liberal and NDP chip off at each other's support. But that's also democracy. You don't always get what you want. And I know that it worked out in the past where the conservatives were the ones that were the victims of vote splitting. When you had the then PC and reform parties, and then later on the PC and alliance parties, doing the same thing to the left. Although it sort of balanced out. You had the liberal and the NDP, and you had the two parties on the right, and then you had basically the Bloc Québécois, which was even then a spoiler, at one point the official opposition. But Canadians had a lot of options. And that was the one determining factor that I thought made our system of elections, or at least our history of elections, so much stronger than in the United States, where you're dealing with a binary. You either support the Republican or the Democrat, and that's it. And even though the system itself allows for other parties, no one has ever been in a strong enough situation in recent history where it's made that much of a difference. But for Canadians, that choice is something that the left is terrified of. They would much rather say, no, 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 it has to be Justin Trudeau or that evil, racist, Nazi, sociopath Stephen Harper. Those were all words that I saw even the night of the election, even after he lost, used to describe him. And this is the one thing as well that we can't discount, that Stephen Harper has managed to in some way cement himself as one of the most detested people to ever hold the office of prime minister in Canada. And it is a personal contempt and hatred that people feel for him, who I would venture a guess to say have never even met him. Now, what is the answer to this? Well, for starters, I think we need to have a serious look at whether or not we are prepared to deal with sleeping in the bed that we've made by allowing strategic voting to govern all elections in the future. Because now that it's been proven successful, and I have friends that are out of work as a result of it, but that's democracy. Now that it's been proven successful, I don't think we can put it back into the box in which it came. But here's another side of this discussion that I think needs to be thrown in here. And this is the more important one. What do we do in the future? Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. I think for starters, it means we need to go back to the basics and find conservatism with a small C 
and make that our goal or aspiration politically rather than conservatism with a capital C, recognizing that the Conservative Party has not always been the most small C conservative option. But to add a little bit of context here to why it is in the first place that the Liberals managed to win, I wanted to bring in Anthony Fury, Toronto Sun columnist who wrote that it was feelings not facts that led to the Trudeau majority parliament. Anthony, it's great to have you on the show, sir. Great to talk to you. Thanks for your time today. Hello, sir. Great to be back on the show. So let, let's talk a little bit about how you were feeling going into yesterday, because I, I think most media folk were, were projecting some form of a liberal victory. I didn't think uh, it was going to be as decisive as it was, though. Yeah, the Liberals had 34 seats. They were third-party status, and a majority, you need 170. So, I I mean, even if you're doing well in the polls, it, of course, matters how that plays out at riding-by-riding levels. You can do, like, super well at some polls, uh, and then you get less in other polls, and then you find the middle is at 39%. Uh, So I wasn't particularly expecting to see as big of a sweep as we did to get into the 180-so seat uh, category where they're now sitting at. Definitely a surprise there. And also, I, I, I knew the NDP wouldn't do so well, but man, I wasn't expecting them to tank. Yeah, I, I think that what they had in 2011 in Quebec led to what was going to be an inevitable collapse in their support there in particular, but I was not seeing them losing as much as they did in downtown Toronto, as an example, where you always see a little bit of red and a bit of orange. Yeah, I mean, nobody really in downtown Toronto, nobody has an NDP seat. Olivia Chow, arguably the most prominent NDP, or aside from Tom Mulcair, did not win. Craig Scott, he had Jack Layton's former riding Toronto Danforth. He was projected, actually, uh, to keep his seat. He did not. So they totally left, and that shows you that the all progressives really did abandon Mulcair. I would say because Mulcair was interested in talking about numbers and balanced budgets, and they didn't like that, and also because they did the anyone but Harper vote. And therein lies the the similarities. Uh, Honestly, I I think most people would be surprised by this, but the similarities between Thomas Mulcair and Stephen Harper. And you've pointed this out in your your post, but both of them are are very similar in that I I don't think anyone questions their competence. I mean, people dislike Stephen Harper. People dislike Thomas Mulcair in some cases, but no one looks at them and and, and sees them as sort of a joke or a laughingstock. And that was something that really dogged Trudeau, is that he was really the kid trying to get attention at the grown-up table. And uh, Harper and Mulcair really fed into that. Uh, Absolutely. They're both uh, men with very impressive credentials, resumes. Uh, They're very sort of sober-minded in the way they speak, in the way they behave. They carry themselves in an avuncular fashion. They don't act like the, you know, the the cool brother who's got your back like Trudeau, but as a father-uncle figure, uh, you can see them standing on the world stage quite well. And Mulcair, uh, the the other key similarity, Andrew, was that Mulcair and Harper both talked about numbers. Mm -hmm. They talked about facts. They talked about issues, whereas Trudeau largely talked about uh, uh, feelings and emotional impacts and and concepts as opposed to policy specifics. So bring this back to then the the postmortem of this election. How did that really end up hurting them in your eyes? Well, and, you know, I'm, I'm getting flooded with hate mail for saying it. I'm saying that the electorate is stupid or something. I'm not, not saying this at all. But, I mean, if a guy who didn't really focus on specifics but focused on touchy-feelies wins with a majority, clearly there is something about those touchy-feelies that people wanted. I think the challenge, Andrew, is that this day and age, people want uh, something transcendent from their politicians. That was obviously part of the je ne sais quoi with Barack Obama. And to not make this some left-wing s- smear... That was also a lot of what we saw in Rob Ford, and that people wanted uh, a regular Joe who transcended the political class. So you see that in all spectrums, and I, I think that's largely behind Donald Trump's appeal as well. But the truth is, nothing transcends politics. Politics is just about the numbers and the facts. If you want something that transcends politics, that's, I don't know, love and friendship and <laughs> hanging out with your family on the weekend. It's just not the political realm. Do you think this is a one-off that Trudeau was able to win with this uh, approach to uh, the the electorate and to the voters? Or do you think that this is ultimately a new reality in Canadian politics, where people are less concerned with the numbers, less concerned with the facts, and more concerned with what you've called uh, in your piece a popularity contest? I'll never forget some data from an abacus poll from 2013. 13 or 2014, actually, that showed that in Ontario, people who had read 
Kathleen Wynne's budget were least likely to vote for it. I think this day and age... Unfortunately, it's like four people that decide they want to sit down and read a budget, though. That's the problem. (laughs) Well, that's true. A few people (laughs) read budgets anyway. Um, But I think we're living in an age with Twitter and social media where our brains are just wired. No matter how how academic we are, we don't sit down and and read the documents. We're we're just seeing the ticker that passes us by uh, on the highway, and that's how we get our information. So it's it's far more easy easy to get kind of hoodwinked by by a quick sell than it was in the past. Uh, that's not an indication, I think, of voters' intelligence, but just a matter of our schedules and the way that we consume media. Yeah, because I, I was baffled when I heard comments that Trudeau had made about things like basically – praising deficits, talking about how deficits are a measure of success in uh, the way a country budgets. And and I'm looking at this well hearing his equivocation by also attacking Stephen Harper on running deficits. And I'm wondering, how does this not bother Canadians? And it was the same as the provincial election in Ontario. I'm hearing the things Kathleen Wynne is saying, and I'm like, how is this not bothering uh, Ontarians? And I feel bad if you are a political backroom, uh, war room person who's trying to, to run ads, trying to really advance your ideals. And the facts are already there and Canadians just don't want to take them or, or can't put the two pieces together that other people can so plainly see. John Maynard Keynes, who's considered the godfather of modern economics and is generally considered a liberal, someone held up by liberal circles, he said, you run deficits when times are bad to spur the economy, and then when you're getting back on track, you stop running deficits because you want to get the books back in order to prepare for the next time there's a downturn. Now, Canada is definitely not in a recession anymore. We've seen that the past two reported months have growth in our economy, and, and, and even if you thought we were in a recession before, it was not a bad recession. Now is not the time to finance what the Liberals proudly proclaimed was the largest, largest infrastructure spending project ever in Canadian history, largely financed by deficits. It, it is very strange, and but I think they know that the reason they're able to get away with it, and a little preview of what my column in tomorrow's papers is going to say, is that because Stephen Harper did bring our debt-to-GDP ratio down to you know very, very uh, decent levels, you can actually rack up the debt uh, by tens of billions of dollars a year, and economic growth is probably going to give you cover fire uh, to do that, and it's not going to actually harm the economy. So I think their, their economics are wrong, but they know they can get away with it. Yeah, and you've really drawn the parallel between Trudeau and Barack Obama, I, I think very similar in terms of the ones who came out and they appealed more than any of their predecessors had, uh, certainly in recent memory, in wooing a younger vote, people that t- typically don't show up as often. They both uh, traded on a vision rather than actual experience, and both of them saw success with that. Absolutely. And there's a book that came out in, I think, 2011 called The Amateur, and it was showing that Barack Obama was the least experienced person to have ever become a president. People like to say, ah, George Bush is stupid or whatever, whether he's stupid or not. I mean, he ran a corporation and he was governor of a major state, so that counts for something. Um, However, I would say that Barack Obama looks like a god compared to Justin Trudeau in just the very negligible resume that Prime Minister Trudeau brings to the job. Obviously, I, he's got a majority mandate, so I, I wish him well, and I hope he does a strong job and, and you know listens to his advisors well. But Andrew, this is, this is unprecedented in Canadian history. You don't have to like Stephen Harper. You can frothingly mad hate Stephen Harper, but that doesn't automatically mean that Justin Trudeau is, is brilliant. You have to judge him by his own merits, and his merits were always very slim. And, and past liberal leaders greatly credentialed Bob Ray, Michael Ignatieff. Anthony Fury joining me on the line, Toronto Sun columnist. Looking forward to seeing your piece in tomorrow's paper, but we'll obviously have a link to your uh, column that we're talking about now on our Facebook page. Anthony, thanks as always for your time, sir. Pleasure as always. Now, that interview was uh, broadcast on my daily radio show the day after the election, and I think, though, it is anything but dated. Because these are things that, again, if we talk about wanting to build a legacy, wanting to build a small C conservative, I'm going back to that term again, dynasty, if you will. We need to understand our weaknesses. And and look, I love Stephen Harper's approach to so many issues. But he was imperfect. He was politically flawed in a lot of ways. And he was, and I know people will dislike this, he was the conservative party's biggest weakness in this particular election. 
And that's not, by the way, at any fault of his. But he was the biggest weakness because he was so unpopular. And I'm not saying that a change in leadership before the election would have been viable, nor would it have done anything. But Harper fatigue and Harper derangement syndrome were unbuckable realities that the conservative campaign had to contend with. And I look at my city of London, Ontario, you had Ed Holder and Susan Troupe, two members of parliament, one who had served two terms, one who was on her first term, both lost their re-election bids. And that was in a lot of ways because of the national trend. Now, I am not blaming anyone for this. Merely looking at what the realities of the situation are so that we can make sure we fix them in the future. And that's the most important thing. I'm glad that I have the privilege and the luxury of not caring for personal career reasons, what happens to any particular party. My concern is as a Canadian. My concern is because I think there should be more and more examples of us looking at a true sense of what the ideal circumstances would be, at what the ideology we want to see govern Canada is. It's that simple. It is absolutely that simple. Now, I've been unequivocal since the start of the campaign. I thought Stephen Harper was the best choice on a lot of different fronts on national security, on the economy. That does not, by the way, equate to an endorsement of perfection, quite the contrary. But in an election, there is a matter that needs to be dealt with of choosing the lesser of evils or choosing the best viable choice. And John Robson, fellow rebel, wrote about this, historian Dr. John Robson, and he wrote about why he had had enough with Stephen Harper. And I I was not as uh, impassioned in my distrust of certain parts of the Conservatives' record. Uh, Namely, uh, Robson pointed out things like boutique tax credits, which are less ideal than wholesale tax cuts or simplification of the tax code. And I, I agree with that. That's a valid point. He didn't like the idea of handouts, which is what he thought they were, and a number of other items that the Conservatives had resorted to for their election purposes. But you know what? Even that didn't bother me that much. What bothered me is that so many conservatives in Canada were waiting for him to come out as a Reagan. So many conservatives were waiting for Stephen Harper to come out as Canada's answer to the 1980s President Ronald Reagan. And it didn't happen when he was elected in 2006. And people said, just wait, just wait. He has a minority government. He can't rock the boat too much. And I said, OK. And then 2008 came and people said, still, we've got to wait. There's an official opposition that can topple the government at any time. We've got to be careful. And I said, okay, that makes sense. And there were gains, lowering the GST as a prime example of something that made things easier for a lot of Canadians. And then 2011 came. The year of the conservative Stephen Harper majority. And I was giddy because I'm thinking, great. Now we can get income tax reductions. Now we can get so many different things that we want. Now we can get all of the things. We can get income splitting, not just for seniors, but for everyone. We can get Senate reform. We got none. There were some positives. There were a lot of positives, in fact. But there weren't the big, small-C, National Citizens Coalition era Stephen Harper promises that so many of us were anticipating, were hoping for. And that's not Stephen Harper's fault, by the way. I think people viewed Stephen Harper as a far more conservative prime minister than he ever campaigned to be. And I think that he was getting advice from people that said, look, this is Canada. You have to be more of a centrist. And I think on the social issues, Canadians saw that, and obviously social conservatives were quite frustrated at Stephen Harper's, not refusal, but his impatience for social conservatives, specifically pro-lifers in his own caucus. The most vocal of which, Stephen Woodworth, was actually defeated 
on Monday, and I think Kitchener-Waterloo was the riding. I might have the riding wrong, but it's one of the Kitchener-Waterloo area ridings. And that's the circle of life. A lot of good people were unseated on Monday. But again, now is ground zero for the next generation of the conservative movement. Forget about the politicians. The conservative movement. And this is where we need to acknowledge where the true battleground really is. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that when we come back after the break here. You are listening to Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Stay with us, Canada. We'll be back in just a moment. He's unapologetic, unwavering, and unafraid to take on the left sacred cows. He's Andrew Lawton, and you're listening to Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. We are back here on Lawton Online on the Rebel.media, and I mentioned something just before the break that I really wanted to focus on here. And this is when we get to that whole inspirational, uplifting nonsense that I said I was going to try to do here. I know I'm not usually the ray of sunshine, but I'll do my best here. And that is that we focus too much on elections when we are trying to advance conservatism. And I realize this will sound to so many of you counterintuitive because this is not a belief system that is really caught up in Canada yet, and I think it needs to be. And I want to qualify this by saying that we are not in my eyes anyway, nor am I advocating for an ignorance to elections and to the significance of them. But we have to recognize that there are ways we can win without winning in the polls, and these ways take place year-round. Not just every four years or whenever we have another election and wherever, whenever we're due for a change in parliament, legislature, government, city council, prime minister, etc. And it is the culture war. Not the battle between different ethnic cultures, but the battle, to put it in a very simplistic way, popular culture. And the way that we live, the way that we speak, the things that we view, the things that we consume, the way we discuss politics, the way discourse in other areas takes place. This is far more important than who is living at 24 Sussex Drive. And it's a part of the battle that, unfortunately, all too many people ignore. And if you want to know who didn't ignore it, it was Andrew Breitbart, the wonderful author and publisher the purveyor of what became Breitbart.com, but was initially a series of sites, big government, big journalism, big peace. I think there were a couple of others as well. Andrew Breitbart knew that winning elections was important, but he knew that winning the culture war was far more significant. And that's why he focused on bolstering conservative artists, conservative actors, conservative film tried to inject himself in media far more than campaigning for a Republican, because the fact is there's always going to be a fluidity to who's in government. One day it'll be a left-wing person. Four years later, it'll be a right-wing person. Four years later, maybe you'll get a re-election of the right-wing person. But eventually it's going to go back to the way it was before. And let's look at the worst-case scenario in Canada right now. Canada has had nine years, almost ten years come January, of Stephen Harper's rule, a conservative prime minister. And even if he wasn't as conservative as some of us would have liked, he was pretty good, I think. And anything that he did could theoretically be reversed in just a couple of weeks by Justin Trudeau. If Justin Trudeau wanted, granted it would be unpopular, but if he wanted, he could go in and hike the GST to 7%. What's to stop him? He could go in and bring back the long-form census. As a matter of fact, I think he will. He could go in and bring back the long gun registry. Again, I don't know why he would, but he could if he wanted. Things he has pledged to do and the presence of bombers in northern Iraq and Syria as part of our mission against ISIS. 
This has been pinpointed as one of his top priorities. The work that we've done, the things that we have done to engage over there will be gone overnight if he has his way, or should I say when he has his way, because he has a majority government. Not really any opposition that can do anything substantive to block his agenda. He could reverse income splitting. He could reverse all of the tax credits that the government has, as a conservative government, put into place. He could do all of this. And there would be absolutely nothing to stop him. Now, this is the way the country works. I'm not taking issue with our system of government. I'm taking issue with the fact that there is very little to ensure a legacy of anyone that you like. Now, it goes the other way as well. If Justin Trudeau loses to a conservative in four years, they can replace everything that he did as well, in some cases overnight, because there aren't really enough things that you can do that are permanent. And we can take solace in that when there's a bad person in power, but we also have to lament it when there is a good person in power. So if we're fighting for things like lower taxes, things like a stronger national security, things like moral values in society, these are all things that I'm pretty sure most people listening in believe in to some extent. I may have lost some on the moral value side, but I'm talking about not state-imposed moral values. These and any other things that you care about, whatever they are, list them in your mind, write them down on a piece of paper, doesn't matter. Is it going to be better off if we have those things imposed by a government that can change in just a couple of years, or do we want those things desired by other people? Do we want those things instead to be desired by individual people, by voters? So much so that voters only vote for people who believe those things. I'm obviously a little biased here, but I think that is far more superior and has a lot more staying power and longevity than where Canadians currently focus their ambitions now, which is just electing a person that believes in what they believe, who will then have free reign for four years before someone else goes in and goes the opposite direction. Now, here's the problem. Now, there are two things that need to be acknowledged here. Number one, just because something can be reversed doesn't mean it will be. When you look at the shocking number of similarities between a government and their opposition generally, it would astonish people to figure out just how much the liberals would not do to change what the conservatives did and vice versa, by the way. You know, I look at things like the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, for example, which is, for those of you not in Ontario, basically a state-mandated provincial government plan to have a provincial supplement to the Canada Pension Plan, which could cost employees up to 1.9% of their income off of every paycheck that then their employer has to match. So the federal government has called it a job-killing payroll tax, And that was a key point by the Conservatives in the federal campaign. And to be honest, I think they're right. I think it's an absolute scam. If the leader of the PC party is elected, Patrick Brown is his name, a former Conservative MP who stepped aside to seek the leadership and won of the PC party. If he's elected, will he slam the brakes on the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan? Or will he campaign against it, that it was a bad idea, and then say, we need to move on to other things? Mandatory emissions testing for vehicles. Will the PC party leader, if elected and he becomes the premier, will he slam the brakes on those or just say, let's focus on other things? You see, a lot of leaders, when they become elected once and for all, they sort of forget all the things that they used to think were so terrible about their predecessor. And the voters forget about it as well, because after all, we only pay attention to what we're told is still an issue. Voters as a group are kind of fickle, as unfortunate as it may seem, which is why, again, it is so important to have a conservatism sweep the culture of this country rather than simply the legislature. And it's not that I'm saying we should ignore what happens in Ottawa or in Toronto or in Edmonton or in whatever your provincial capital is. All of these things, all of these things are so paramount, but we have to focus on both. 
And this is why I've always been critical, and I know this is getting off the topic a little bit here, but hey, it's my show, so why not? It's something I've always been critical of when conservatives especially, we're the worst ones at this, throw up our hands and say, yeah, you know, screw it. That's just, you know, Hollywood. Oh, yeah, that's just, you know, mainstream music. I don't listen to that. There's only two types of music in my mind, country and Western. I'm not going to watch a movie. Liberal scum, that's what they all are. And, well, there is invariably a fair bit of merit to that. I think we're selling ourselves a little bit short here. If we think that we should live our life only dealing in politics and nothing else, not at all trying to change these things. And this is why, again, in the U.S., they seem so far ahead of where Canadian conservatives are here. And I think this is to our detriment. And people have tried. And this was one of the things that was great about Sun News, is that Sun News actually had boots on the ground. It wasn't just conservative commentary on issues of the day, but they actually had, for example, Rebecca Thompson's documentary, Downwind. They had fun segments. Ezra Levant with a chainsaw, David Menzies with a bucket of fried chicken, interviewing someone from PETA. This sort of stuff happened all the time. And even more so at the Rebel.media, which is why I'm so thrilled to be a part of the Rebel. But herein lies the problem. So many people wash their hands of culture, saying it's a bygone conclusion that the left has dominated it, and we don't realize how much power exists in that part of the country. That isn't to say, by the way, that we're all of a sudden going to start getting conservative films made and that we're all of a sudden going to, you know, get rid of the Susan Sarandons in the world and replace them with the Kirk Camerons, if you will. Because these are the top names that come to mind when I think of, you know, famous lefty and, and famous righty. But we have to start trying. You know, I look at movies like The Giver, for example. The Giver is based on a children's book, not a a children's book. It's more of like a preteen age novel, if you will, and it's ultimately about a dystopian society. Everything is in black and white, very similar to Pleasantville. And young students reach a certain age, and instead of their bar mitzvah, this coming-of-age ceremony, they're presented with their role in society. You're a nurturer. You're a provider. There's no emotion. It's very detached. And it's about this society becoming completely controlled by the state, robbed of emotion, robbed of feeling, robbed of love, because control was better. It was a depiction in a very accessible manner of a sort of emotional fascism. It was a conservative book and became a conservative film. And the film grossed in the millions and millions of dollars. People absolutely loved it. People learned it. People ate up the message. I didn't know it was a conservative film. Didn't know that it was a film that was trying to impart to them some form or kernel of a conservative message. Did it change the world? No. But it offered a contrast from the era of films that we've seen in the last 10 years, like The Hangover and Knocked Up, which, don't get me wrong, are are well-written and funny films, but not really much of a moral message there. Another great example from several years ago, Juno, starring Ellen Page, about a young high school student who becomes pregnant, decides to keep the child, and it's about her process of getting the baby adopted, how she deals with this as a young mother, and what her options are. It was, according to the writer a pro-life film. Now, Ellen Page, who's now a very radical left-winger, tried to trip up Ted Cruz at a campaign event a little while ago. She's disavowed it, said, no, 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 it's not a pro-life movie. But it was. And that movie imparts a pro-life message to those who watch it. Again, it is a movie that is not out-in-your-face conservative, but imparts a message that I think most conservatives would find to be a valuable one. Atlas Shrugged. Wonderful, wonderful book. Terrible, terrible movie. Unfortunately, that movie was guided by someone that was more insistent on getting the political message across than getting a good film across. And that's the problem, is that if you try to preach to someone, you're going to fail. And Steven Crowder, 
who's absolutely great, a good friend of mine, he has said time and time again that you need to produce good content. He said he'll have people, because he does stand-up comedy, he's done acting, he says he'll get people that come to him and say, hey, I've got a great idea for a conservative screenplay. And he said, no, no, no. I want a good screenplay. A good TV show, a good single, a good album, etc. And if there's a conservative message or subtext to it, great. But it has to be good first. And the problem is with conservatives, we don't do enough to support good quality conservative content. We really love to cannibalize our own in that way. And I think this is one of our failings and why we are losing the culture war. And the culture war, by the way, is not just about pop culture. It's not just about movies and music and television, although those do play a a huge role in it. The culture war is also about the political battles that take place outside of a house of government. Your kid not being able to bring a peanut butter sandwich to school. You not being able to say blackboard at the office because someone somewhere complained to HR that it was racist. Stores that say we're going to have holiday sales instead of Christmas sales just because they're worried that someone might be offended. Not because someone actually was offended, but they're worried that someone might be. These are the examples of the front line of the culture war, and these are the examples of where conservatives are losing. And even if Stephen Harper were reelected with a majority government this week, these things would not have changed because these are the battles we need to be fighting. And thankfully, we are fighting on a daily basis. These are the things that we need to make our top priority instead of putting our heads in our hands, shaking them and saying, oh, my goodness, how could Canada be this doomed? Because politics follows culture. And we've allowed cultural leftism, cultural Marxism, to become the norm so much so that that breeds into politics. Like we were chatting about earlier on in the show with Anthony Fury, you know, we hear that Trudeau wants to do all this sort of stuff. The average person doesn't understand how that's problematic. The average person doesn't understand how well, wait, you're promising to spend money that we don't have. You're acknowledging it's a deficit, but you're saying this is good for the economy, but then it's bad for the economy when Stephen Harper does it. There is zero defense for that dichotomy that he's created and is failing in trying to navigate, but still people vote for him. Same as those who vote for Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne to get her reelected in 2014. Because cultural Marxism is at stake here. So I do not pretend, contrary to how I may come across, to have all the answers. But I know where the beginning is. And I know where the next steps need to be. And I know where the next steps are. And this is the one example that I can give you here as to why the culture war is so important. Because we will win elections and we will lose elections. There's never going to be a 50-year period in history where you have then two generations of one party with uninterrupted rule. And I'm not saying there should be. In fact, I think that would probably do a disservice not only to the party itself, but also to the country. So when we look at the generation to generation passing of the baton, let's get out of this mindset that views elections as the be all and end all. And that's not to say we shouldn't want to win elections. We do and I do. And I'm not running in them, so I don't really have a voice to complain too, too much about the results of these things. My opinion is worth one vote at the end of the day, just like yours is. But what needs to happen here is we need a wholesale shift, not only in the way that we view the political process, but the way we view what leads to that. Why does someone vote for a liberal? And I don't mean a big L capital liberal party liberal, but a liberal, someone who believes in the tenets of leftism. Is it because they're dumb? I don't think so. Is it because the guy has nice hair? Well, maybe a couple, but I don't think that's it either. As fun as the jokes are. No, it's because they were led to believe that that makes them a certain way. People vote 
for liberals because of the identity that is attached to that. It means I'm progressive. It means I'm nice. It means I'm not racist. They've sold people on a lifestyle, not on actual policy. They've sold people on an ideology that they don't know is an ideology because they presented it as an identity. And this is what we've talked about on the podcast in the past, exactly why identity politics has such a foothold in Canada right now, because the left has presented this world, this paradigm in which if you are X, Y, Z, whatever the group is, you must vote liberal or NDP. If you're gay, you can't be a conservative. If you're black, you can't be a conservative. If you're Muslim, you can't be a conservative. The list goes on and on. And frankly, it's been interesting because up until this election, and we don't know the ethnic breakdown or the cultural breakdown of this particular election just yet, but up until this time, the conservatives have always been extraordinary on the minority front. South Asians have shown up to support conservatives in droves. When Patrick Brown, the Ontario PC leader, won the leadership of his party, it was in no small part because of the outreach that he did to a number of ethnic groups across the country, going to every gurdwara, every temple, and every facility that he could think of that had different groups that the PC party needed to, in his eyes, reach out to. And he tried to bring what Jason Kenney's approach in the Conservative Party was, and successful approach, I might add, to the Ontario PC party. And for his leadership bid anyway, it worked. We won't find out until 2018 whether it works at the general level in elections. But I guess the reason I can't bring myself to be so upset here is the same reason that in 2012, I wasn't all that upset when Barack Obama won re-election. For starters, it didn't seem to be that much of a surprise. Mitt Romney was hardly the most compelling candidate for the Republicans. And would it have been nice for a Republican to win? Yeah, but ultimately, most Republicans that I know are not actually people who identify as Republicans anymore. They've ditched the party title and started identifying themselves as conservatives. And this has been basically the divide we've seen in the U.S. in the last several years between the Tea Party Republicans and the establishment Republicans, or better yet, the Tea Party conservatives and the GOP. And perhaps they're going through their own version of what Canada went through almost 20 years ago, with the right becoming two different parties who will eventually have to come together lest they be doomed to vote splitting, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the program. But I think, if anything, it becomes a movement, a cultural battle, there is that word again, to bring the conservative party or the so-called conservative party around to a way of viewing the issues that is fitting with the cultural conservative values that people in the United States still have, regardless of who's in power. Barack Obama gets elected. That does not all of a sudden make the United States of America a liberal country. They vote for him because of the identity they think is attached to that vote. And I've seen a lot of comparisons that Justin Trudeau is Canada's Barack Obama. And I'm not even sure that's the case because you know what? I think even Barack Obama had a lot more going for him and a lot more on his resume than Justin Trudeau did. He was at least a senator. Even for a couple of years, he was still a senator, not a substitute drama teacher. He had still had a great deal of responsibilities. And you know what? He actually showed up to the Senate as well. And he also served at the state level. And hey, even community organizers have done a little bit more than just producing school presentations of Hamlet. And I think there is a huge contrast. But in terms of what they mean to their respective countries, I think the comparison there is valid. I think we see, are seeing similarities in charisma over content. Feelings over facts. Sexiness over substance. Mm -mm -mm. And it's unsurprising. 
because we know that elections are decided by getting out the vote, but they're also decided by that mushy, undecided group in the middle who doesn't really feel any allegiance to any particular ideology. And that group that doesn't feel like they owe their vote to anyone, and they're the group that people try to go after. They're the group that are most susceptible to political advertising, most susceptible to attack ads, which even though people claim they don't like them, are incredibly effective at providing contrast if people are undecided voters. You know, it's kind of funny. I was talking to someone the other day, and this has happened to me a few times in actually in the last year. I was talking to someone yesterday that was painfully unaware of how politics works. They just did not know anything. And given the person's job, I found it a little bit concerning, but they just didn't really know that much. And they made a comment, and I was only half listening, and it caught me off guard. And they said, well, what about the American guy? And we were talking about this Canadian election. It was before the election. And I'm like, what Canadian guy? The, the guy, the Canadian guy. And I'm thinking, or sorry, the American guy, rather. And I'm thinking, what American guy? And, and I'm trying to think of something. I'm like, are you talking about Donald Trump? Are you talking about Mitt Romney? Are you Like, I thought they were trying to draw a parallel. They're like, no, 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 the, the American guy that ran for prime minister in Canada. And I then realized exactly who they were referring to. And I said, do you mean Michael Ignati? If they're like, yeah, the American guy. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is why attack ads work, because you get people who are just half listening. They don't really care. They don't really know, but they hear something. And if you buy enough ads and they can hear it enough times, that all of a sudden is the baseline for how they view a particular person, a particular issue, a particular party, a particular narrative in the campaign. And I think I shared with you already on another occasion, another example of a woman that I knew, again, not very political, but said in a group meeting of some kind that the only thing she knew about Michael Ignatieff is that the only thing he would miss about Canada if he left was Algonquin Park. And again, someone who knew nothing and did not care at all about politics could tell you that about Michael Ignatieff. So we can't discount that these people do hold on to some key details, and it may infuriate us because as much as we can use this to our advantage, if we define a politician who's working against what we believe in, it also means they can work it against us, which is why, again, I can't drill home the point enough that we need to focus on the cultural battles, telling people why conservatism is better. Why something like fiscal restraint is better than debt and deficits. Why lower taxes and more money in your pocket is better than having government bankroll a bunch of social services for you. Why having a strong national security is integral as long as it does not violate the civil liberties of individual people in a country. These are things that to all of us are like a second nature, but we need to have instilled and people are not learning from the Prime Minister of Canada, whoever it may be. People are not hearing what a Prime Minister says and then changing their mind on issues. No, they're hearing everything from the world around them. And that's a simple reality, but still a difficult one to necessarily understand for people. And that's why, not to toot my own horn here, but I think programs like this are so accept- or so effective in a lot of ways, or can be. And other blog posts on The Rebel and other videos on The Rebel and anything that you share on Facebook, because you're impacting people outside of election time. You're helping shape the way they view politics when an election comes around. And you know what? The four years between elections does more to determine the substance and content and future of the country than anything that happens in the 32, well, 78 days of the election campaigns. We've got to take a quick break here. When we come back, we will have a final wrap-up of Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. My name's Andrew Lawton. Stay tuned, Canada. We'll be back in just a moment's time. It's time for It Must Be a Liberal, only on Lawton Online. Scouring every corner of the globe for stories so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. (music) 
Welcome back to Lawton Online. Yes, you heard the man. It's time for my favorite segment, mainly because it's the only specific like segment with a name we do every week. It must be a liberal in which we scour every corner of the globe from Edmonton. I think we know we did Edmonton last week. All right. From Calgary to, I don't know. Kuwait. I know that one starts with a C and one starts with a K. In any case, from Kandahar to Kuwait, from Kentucky to Kansas, we scour every quarter of the globe finding stories so outrageous. There must be a liberal involved. And today we actually go to, well, Florida. Because if you want a bastion of liberalism and behavioral idiocy, Florida is always a good standby. And this one actually is from the Associated Press, where a man and a woman stole $6,000 worth of jewelry from a South Florida art gallery. Now, they were arrested, 24-year-old Megan O'Hara and 19-year-old David Zakowski. They took a bracelet and they took a ring on Sunday from the Attila JK exhibition at the ICFA gallery. They were spotted a short time later at a nearby grocery store and police arrested them. Now, here's the problem. One of the reasons they were able to find them and track them down was because they signed the guest book of the gallery before they made the theft. Officers were obviously a little bit surprised that they used the real name of the woman in the guest book and her phone number. Yeah. You know, there's a part of me when someone commits a heist or a crime, like the kind you see in a Hollywood movie, for example, Inside Man with Clive Owen and Denzel Washington, where they knock off a bank or other areas as well. There's a part of me that thinks, you know what, they've earned it. If you can pull off a successful bank robbery or heist, maybe you've earned it and you get to to get away with it. Yeah, that doesn't apply when you literally give your identity to investigators. It's almost so perfect, they might not even think to look at it. Yeah, I think it's safe to say with 24-year-old Megan O'Hara and 19-year-old David Sikowski, safe to say they must be liberals for what they did. There's really no other way. Now, listen, we are uh, just a bit out of time for the show today. But before we depart, I wanted to share with you a little story that I read also from the Associated Press, by the way, although unrelatedly so. And it's about a woman that I think we need to hold up as somewhat of an inspiration She lives in Buffalo, New York, and her name is Felomena Rotundo. Now, she works at a laundromat, and she refuses to quit. And in fact, she works 11 hours a day, six days a week. She takes one day off, and she has been working nonstop since she turned 15, which was during the Great Depression. She washes clothes every day for 11 hours a day, six days a week at age 100. Oh, yes. She turned 100 years old in the summer, and she said she hasn't continued retirement from the college laundry shop in Buffalo, and she says she won't continue retirement. She says, quote, too many people retire too soon. And she also gave the advice, quote, get out and do some work. Now, these stories are outliers. I think at a certain point, someone has earned the right to relax a little bit. Someone's earned the right to chill out and enjoy their retirement. But I know so many people who have talked about people in their family or people they know who retired and then they died or they just lost their happiness in life. They lost their purpose in life because you know what? Work is something that in a lot of cases makes us happy or makes us feel like we're doing something good. Now, I kind of like sometimes the idea that, you know what, someday I'll get to stop working, but I I wouldn't want to do nothing at all. But this makes me ask the question, not to you listening, of course, but to a lot of people that you may know, what's your excuse? You know, people will come up with excuses as to why they can't work, why they don't want to work, why they don't think they should work, or why something's beneath them. And and I'm like, you know what, when you see a 100-year-old woman who is still putting in 11 hours a day, 66 hours a week, Because she feels it's important, I think we need to bring that work ethic 
to new heights and new levels and a new variety of individuals in this country and, of course, in the United States where she lives. So good for you, Felomena. Keep up the good work. If I'm in Buffalo, I'll get you to clean my clothes for me, which is not meant to sound patronizing. I mean, I'll, I'll keep her employed at the college shop laundry uh, laundry mart or whatever the case uh, of the, uh, the name was. We've got to wrap things up for the show today, folks. But remember, conservatism is not dead, nor even this is the conservative party. One man's political ambitions are gone. A political party needs to refresh. But the ideology that we believe in, smaller government, more freedom, free speech, this still lives on. And never forget that. More Lawton Online next week on the Rebel.media. I'm Andrew Lawton. Thanks so much for tuning in, Canada. Thank you. God bless and good week to you. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.